Hello, everyone. I'm Harvey Brownstone, and today's special guest is a singer and actress who can truly be considered a member of show business royalty for several reasons. First of all, she's the daughter of Yvonne King of the legendary King Sisters, who were hugely popular big band singers and the first female vocal group to sing in four-part harmony. And her father was the iconic pianist, orchestra leader, and musical director, Buddy Cole, who worked with some of the greatest singers of all time and recorded the soundtracks of over a thousand movies. Secondly, she's a member of America's first family of song, the legendary King family, which entertained audiences throughout the 60s and 70s with their own TV series and 17 TV specials. And thirdly, she will forever be remembered as the beautiful, sweet-natured Katie Douglas in one of the greatest TV sitcoms of all time, My Three Sons. When she joined the cast of that show in its eighth season as Robbie Douglas's fiance and then his wife, she became an international sensation, receiving more fan mail than any other actor in any of Don Federson's many TV productions. And she won Photoplay Magazine's People's Choice Award for the Most Promising Actress. And get this, the episode of My Three Sons where Katie Douglas gave birth to triplets was the number one show in the Nielsen ratings for that week. Our guest has been entertaining audiences since she was a toddler. In addition to performing on TV and on tour with the King family and as a member of the immensely popular Four King Cousins and her iconic role on My Three Sons, she had a recurring role on Hawaiian Eye opposite Robert Conrad and Troy Donahue. She guest starred in TV shows including The Lucy Show, To Rome With Love, Adam 12, and many more. And when you thought you were listening to Raquel Welch singing on her 1970 TV special, you were actually hearing the voice of our fabulous guest. She's appeared in a number of theatrical productions, including I Do, I Do, The Boyfriend, Trail of Dreams, and Chemical Imbalance. And for 10 years, she played Ethel Mertz in an I Love Lucy tribute show. For her stellar performance in the 2014 movie, See Me, she won the Vanguard Award at the Sacramento Film Festival. And in 2014, she received the Golden Halo Award for Lifetime Achievement in the Motion Picture and Television Industry. And now she's released her long-awaited, highly anticipated autobiography entitled My Three Lives, A Memoir, which takes us on an engaging, nostalgic, heartfelt, and sometimes heartbreaking, but always uplifting and inspirational journey through her multifaceted career, her personal relationships, and her enormously strong bond with her beautiful family. I'm delighted to welcome the wonderful Tina Cole to our show. Tina, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, I can think I can now die. I've just had my eulogy. So, <laughs> so I can go now. It's nice to see you, Harvey. <sighs> Tina, I absolutely loved your book. Tell me what made you decide to write it. A lot of pressure from fans and from good friends. And they're realizing that if I didn't do it now, all of my fans will be gone. <laughs> Isn't that awful? Well, now, as far as I know, so far, you're the only member of the King family who's written a book, correct? Oh, my Aunt Louise wrote two, actually, about the early days of the Driggs family be that became the King family. My, my grandfather was William King Driggs. So her book really starts at the beginning with the Driggs family becoming the King family. And your cousin Cam is writing a book about the King family, isn't he? He is. And his is going to be a coffee table, like a picture book. Oh, it's it's going to be wonderful because it it as mine, but his is more in depth uh, with pictures starting from the turn of the century until now. You know, Tina, I was surprised to learn that even though you came from a show business family and even after doing a screen test at the age of 14 and being accepted to study acting at Warner Brothers, you were not planning to have a show business career at that time, were you? I I wanted to be a wife and a mother and maybe a teacher. Mm -hmm. 
Well, when did you know that you wanted to be a professional entertainer? I don't think I ever did. Is that funny, Harvey? No one's asked that question. I I just was. I just did. It just kind of happened. And so I went with it. It was never something that I sought. I something I loved, but still in the back of my head, you know, I wanted the the, the home life and I, I really loved teaching. I love children. You wrote about being so completely naive and alone when it came to navigating a show business career as a young actress. You didn't even have an agent, but you came from a show business family. Why didn't your parents prepare you on how to deal with agents and finances and contracts and all of that? Exactly. I don't know. We tease in my family that we were raised by wolves. We were always with the pack. And but the, the our parents were busy rehearsing and working and recording and and we were just kind of left to play and do and watch them I my dad really didn't want me to get into it he knew it was a tough business my mom loved it and she was happy to to make me an arrangement or sew me a dress but as far as business there was never and What's interesting, I didn't know what I didn't know. I didn't know what I needed to ask. You know, it just, they said, here, oh, we want to screen test you. Oh, okay. Well, we want to test you for the for Hawaiian Eye. Come down. Okay. Three weeks later, I'm in Hawaii. Okay. <laughs> it just, it didn't dawn on me to ask what questions to ask. Does that make any sense? It does make sense because I don't think you felt that you needed to be strategic about a career. You were just doing what came naturally. Yeah, exactly. That That is so well put. Thank you for that. Now, a lot of people may not realize that before you joined the cast of My Three Sons as Katie, you had already appeared in three other episodes on that show entitled House for Sale in season four, The Coffee House Set in season five, and Robbie and the Little Stranger in season six. I told you I'm a big fan. Yeah. Now, I know they auditioned 2,000 girls for the role of Katie, but did your previous appearances on the show give you an advantage over everyone else, do you think? I believe, although they didn't say it, I believe that they used, when they hadn't found the girl they wanted, they went back and looked through the other shows and I think that Robbie and the Little Stranger was actually used as my screen test. What was it like to be an outsider joining a cast and crew that had already been working together for seven years? Did they make you feel welcome? They did. They were wonderful. The, everybody, everybody in the set, the, the boys, the, the, cat, the rest of the cast, the crew, Fred McMurray was just as warm and, and kind as he could be. And in fact, he sent me a huge bouquet on my first day from from June and Fred. And people went, oh, my gosh, he's never done that before. Well, you were the first regular female cast member on that show. Actually, Meredith McRae was was on for a for a bit. And and the oldest brother, Tim, married her character before I came on as a regular. So she was seen a lot. I semi-regular, maybe you would say, but I was the first regular female. And I I thought it was rather odd. Usually interviews are maybe five minutes tops. I was with Fred de Cordova, who was our director at the time, as before he left to, to produce Johnny Carson. I spent half an hour, 45 minutes with him about the nuances of the character, about how she, you know, bringing in a, a female into this all-male household that people were, you know, so in love with the show and that she could either be hated or she could be welcomed in and how important, you know, she could, she needed to be sweet, but not sugary. She needed to be a little feisty, but not bitchy. She needed, and and she needed to endear the audience. 
So, I mean, a long time spent on that. And I thought, that's, you know, that, that's odd. And then I went in and talked to Ed Hartman, our producer, for another, you know, half hour or so. And again, I was thinking, this is really a long interview. And then they took me into a room and there was Fred McMurray and June. And they had to, so I had another half hour interview with them. They all wanted to make sure that I would fit, you know, that, uh, that, that the audience would accept me and accept the show for the change. Well, you came from a very close family, and I always thought that gave you an advantage. You understand family dynamics very, very well. Oh, yes, that's true. In our family, there were so many women, and so, you know, no one, and so many kids, no one could ever be a star. Everyone, you know, got equal, equal time. Well, I got to tell you that I thought there were two stars in the King family, one of them was your mom, Yvonne. I adored her. I thought she just sparkled on the screen. And the other one was you. And if anybody thinks I'm just making it up, I'm going to show you. I actually went to an autograph show in Hollywood many years ago where you and your mom were. And you signed this picture for me, which I've cherished my whole life. So I just a great thrill. And I want my viewers to know, this is how wonderful Tina Cole is. I told Miss Cole at that time and her mom, Yvonne, that I was a lawyer and that I was on track to becoming a judge, but my real desire was to be a talk show host. And I only really went into the legal profession because I wanted to satisfy my parents who were so disappointed that I turned out gay. And <laughs> Yvonne, may she rest in peace. She was the most beautiful human being. And Miss Tina Cole said to me, Harvey, follow your dreams be a really great judge. And when you're done with that, then you can have a talk show. And Tina said, and I'll come on your show. And now it's happened. And here I am. You're going to make me weep. I, my, they tease that my tear ducts are connected to my bladder. So <laughs> I have to be careful. because Oh, Harvey. That, and it's a, such a wonderful story. I'm so glad that I was so glad I was nice then. Oh, yeah, you were really nice. You know, my favorite episode of yours on My Three Sons was the one where you learned how to drive. Do you have a favorite episode? Got it. That's my favorite, too. Really? That's the one that I I had the most fun with. And, you know, there wasn't a lot of the, the comedy in sitcoms, you know, like that were the, the comedy was subtle. It wasn't laugh out loud, you know, the timing, except Fred McMurray when he would do some of his shtick, who his, you know, he could say more with a lift of one eyebrow than a lot of actors could say with their whole bodies. But doing that driving scene, I got to really show off my my comedic timing. And I was I love that. Was, I'm so glad you said that. Well, it was my favorite episode. Now, you know, as you know, My Three Sons is the second longest running sitcom that has been broadcasted continuously for over 50 years. What do you think accounts for the enduring popularity of that show? Oh, boy. I think that it, you know, it started, you know, as Vietnam, as things were starting to change in our society people were trying to hold on to family and to you know dad being wise and not not just at work but be, being wise and not you know leaving the family there there was too in the beginning a lot of chaos a lot of shows didn't show that you know the boys are playing basketball in the house and running and jumping over the banisters and you know it started out that way and and there, but there was a, a respect for, there was a respect for family that came through. And I think that even, especially today, where the family is so fractured, I think people still today are, are hanging on to that. I do too. I think that was one of the first sitcoms, along with Andy Griffith, where you saw a lot of warmth 
in the mm-hmm. family. It wasn't just about the comedy. It was about the warmth. And I've got to tell you, Tina, I don't think you really get how really beloved you became in that show that, I mean, you didn't come on there until season eight yeah. and yet everybody I've mentioned your name to in the last month and a half, right away, they say, Oh, she was the star of my three sons. Did you understand at the time that you were unbelievably beloved? No, I had no idea. I just went to work. <laughs> I just went to work. But I was also doing that, you know, raising a, a son by myself. I was, you know, doing the King family. I was doing the King cousins. I was on talk shows and game shows. There was there was a time and I was looking at, you know, through my date books and schedules and things. And I was on television every single day of the week. I don't know who else did that somewhere you could see me doing something a commercial or whatever and I but it didn't as I say you know with the family nobody could be a star nobody felt that it never it it, it, even when Don Federson brought me in and showed me the fan mail I thought oh isn't that nice (laughs) you know people like me it's like Sally Field oh you like me you really like me I didn't get it. I think that's a good thing because it kept you humble. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. You know what? To what I, I'm proud of, I guess, I was as well accepted by the women as well as the men. And I had a, a big gay following, a big. So it was like I didn't. You know, I was a sex symbol where, you know, the women were jealous. I wasn't a, you know, I didn't, I don't know. I don't know, but whatever that was, I guess I was born with. I don't know, but I also just have this intrinsic love for people. Just, you know, and when I was a little girl, even my my girlfriend's (laughs) mothers would ask for my advice. I think you have an ability to convey sincerity and warmth and love. And that's what it was. Thank you. Now, you had a very intense personal relationship with Don Grady, who played your husband, Robbie Douglas. You wrote that he was the one who taught you the meaning of unconditional love. How did he do that? I remember one time in particular where we got into a fight, as all couples do. In my mind, when you did that, that meant that you weren't loved, that, that the fighting. And he, got, he was so mad at me for something. And he, and he said, he started to leave the house and he came back and he said, look, I love you. Right now, I'm really upset about whatever it was. I can't even remember. He said, this has nothing to do with how much I love you. Just let me be mad. I'll, I'll, I'll be back. Let me go blow off steam. I didn't know that that was a thing. Isn't that crazy? And yet I always felt loved by my family, by my parents. But there was something about needing, you know, if I, if I was yelled at, then I was not loved as much. I don't know why, where that came from. But he showed me that that, you know, that and I and I, I I raised my children that way. I'm not mad at you. I'm I'm upset with what you did has nothing to do with my love for you. That's a beautiful thing. And that's exactly what good parenting is all about. I want to ask you a few questions about the King family, because I was a huge fan of the show and all the specials when the King family TV show first started. There was a very famous newspaper article written by Irma Bombeck, and the headline said, Can the King Family Be Real? What did you think of that article, Tina? Oh, we were thrilled. To, for Irma Bombeck to write about us was, you know, that that was like top honor. And that she, and she was so cute about, you know, the way she wrote and 
you know, crime in Italy, you know, a, 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 I, I, what was the funny thing? I've never seen so many people show up in the same dress, you know, without, and how the, to see a, a boy dancing with his mother, things like that. She really captured uh, the way we felt about each other and the show. And the show reflected, really reflected our lives, our, our lives at home. Well, I don't want to get all teary eyed, but my favorite episode of the King Family TV show was the 1967 Christmas show where Alice King was surprised on the air by the return of her son from the Vietnam War. That was truly an unforgettable television moment, wasn't it? It really was. And and the truth is that our cousin Ricky was at boot camp for the army. He was up at Fort Ord. And he, they tried and tried and tried to get him out to do the special. And no matter what, they said, absolutely not. A boot camp is only, what, six weeks or whatever, and we need him there. And so that's when they set up the number with Alice singing at the piano with Ricky's picture, my cousin Lex playing and Cam introducing them. My mom and dad somehow pulled strings and they, and this is my stepfather, who I call my dad because he was my dad for 40 years. You know, my father passed away when, when I was 21. So he was only 46, 47 years old. So my papa was, was directing the show. They got Rick out. They hid him at their house for a day and not one of us in the family or the crew knew that Ricky was going to surprise his mother. So that was as real as you could get. We were all standing behind the cameras, just hugging each other and crying and jumping up and down. The yeah. most beautiful, beautiful moment. The King family's last performance was in January 1996 for the state of Utah's sesquicentennial celebration. 80 family members showed up for that event and your three youngest children sang with the family. That must have been such an emotional experience for you, Tina. It was, and they loved it. They just, you know, to feel a part of that. If, if anybody saw it, you can see it on YouTube. You'll notice us looking around because we were, we were at the Delta Center where the jazz play basketball and people were on all sides of us. So it was like a three on both sides. And in the front, we had the Mormon Tabernacle Choir in the back and, and the Utah Symphony playing with us for us. But we were looking at, at the people watching. We were looking at each other going, oh my gosh, look, here we are. We're all here. It, it was, it was a, the feeling there was so strong. You know, it was just um, magical. It was. It was for us. And I apparently the our prophet of our church said, now that's that's a family. That's what we want to see. And I, it just was such a thrill for us. Yeah. Well, in 2009, there was a wonderful PBS special entitled Christmas with the King Family, which features many memorable clips from the TV show and the TV specials over the years. And I understand it was your idea, Tina, to produce a cookbook, correct? Well, it was. We had put together, my cousin uh, Zan kind of did all the work. Uh, we put together a cookbook for the last family reunion. Uh, we had that in Utah. And I think that was, what was it, 04, maybe? And we said, we need to have our recipes. So everybody gave Zan their recipes and she put together a cookbook. And I thought, this is going to be for PBS. They do the, you know, you can get the CD, you can get the DVD, you can get, well, how about, let's do the cookbook. So uh, Shane and Renee, our, our producers, Polio Entertainment, said that's a great idea. They really put it together with the pictures and we all contributed, you know, we, we 
adjusted the other cookbook. So we took some things out and added some things. It's really fun, I, I think, because of the pictures. But <laughs> my sister said something that kind of cracked me up. She said, well, it's not very enlightened. And I said, Kathy, it's comfort food. It's family. It's not supposed to be <laughs> enlightened. It's good old home cooking. And that's, so we were tickled that that came out. We loved it. And just to give you a bit of a plug, there's a couple of special Tina Cole recipes in your autobiography as well at the end of the book. Yes. Yeah. I I, uh, I wanted to put a few more in, but I thought, well, if they want, they can get the cookbook. Exactly. You wrote in your book that appearing on the Hollywood Squares was one of the hardest things you ever had to do. Now, when I read that, I couldn't believe it because you managed to avoid being seduced by the likes of Troy Donahue and Robert Conrad. Why was Hollywood Square so difficult? I had never had improv experience. I was not a you know, funny person. I wasn't witty like that. I appreciated wit. I felt I felt that I plus politics and history. My retention wasn't real great with that. I could tell you every song that was ever written, but <laughs> as far as you know, the historical things, or I'm much better now. So I figured I was I was the dumb square. I was the pretty square, and you know they needed to have a pretty square, but it. It panicked me. They did not give us answers, folks. Truth. They did not tell us this, you know, say this, you can you can answer with that. They did come in like an hour before and say, if you're asked a historical question, you might say George, you know, name one of the presidents or something like that. But it didn't mean you were going to get that question. So there was no help. And I would just... I'd sit there and just nervous, you know, panic, because what if they asked me a question when I, I really came off really dumb? <laughs> well, you never did. And I uh, want you to know that, yes, you were the pretty square, but you were never square, just so you know. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Now, I can't resist asking you, Tina, what was it like playing Ethel Mertz for 10 years? That was one of the hardest things I've ever done. We just did it locally. And I have a girlfriend who looked just like Lucy. And I asked her if she would help me with a fashion show that I was doing for the Cancer League. They wanted some 50s ambiance. And they said, could you do like Lucy? And I said, well, I can't do Lucy, but I have a friend who could. And I could certainly do Ethel. Well, we were such a hit just being ambient characters for the fashion show that people started hiring Lucy. I didn't want to do it, but she came up with an idea of actually doing a whole script, a, a tribute show. The hardest part was it was all lip sunk, lip synced to the actual tracks of the television show. So we had to lip sync and and like, I remember one of Ethel's lines was on the same dress where they, you know, they show up in the same dress at the at benefit or whatever. And she said, imagine us buying the same dress at two different stores or something. But she took a breath. Imagine us buying the same dress at two different stores, whatever it was. There were some pauses. Well, that had to be exact because bad lip sync is really bad. <laughs> so we we got really good at it. And it was so much fun. You wouldn't have recognized Ethel really without Lucy. Lucy, of course, you know, is iconic. But bring, bringing Ethel with Lucy, I, I did get the nuances. I did get the, 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 the sarcastic humor that she had. And I had a ball doing it. It was really fun. Now, you know, Tina, if I can get serious for a moment, yeah. one of the things that really shone through for me in your book was your maturity as a young woman. I'll give you an example. 
On August the 24th, 1964, you attended a private party in Brentwood and you met the Beatles. And then you got invited to the home where they were staying for an even more private party that you were smart enough to escape from. Where do you think that common sense and good judgment came from? And I'm just going to say, I'm not giving any more information than that because I want people to read the book for themselves. But I will say that that chapter is a very, very enlightening chapter. And so my question to you again, where did you get that common sense and good judgment? A lot of girls at that party were not as smart as you. That's true. And I I think it was my upbringing. I think being raised as a Latter-day Saint, being raised by a mother who, you know, said sex is wonderful when it's right that love, you know, love is more important than anything. And your, your self-esteem, your, you know, you don't, you don't give yourself away if it's not special. And I think that, plus I didn't drink. And I think that, well, I don't want to give it away either. But that scene in the bath, in the powder room with that girl, when I realized, and several times in the book, that protected me. Having the moral values that I did saved me. Making, we always talked about you make the decision beforehand. You know what you're going to say. You plan it out what you're going to say. You don't wait until you're hit with it and then have to come up with an excuse and I guess, you know, so it, it was it was really my upbringing and 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 yeah, just my moral values that that had been, you know, taught to me since I was a babe. Well, you know, Tina, it's rare that you read a celebrity memoir, at least for me, where there's been at least three or four times that I wanted to hug you. You know, it was that powerful and that story about the Beatles party was certainly one of them and there's another one of course everyone knows you're a woman of faith you wrote something in your book that really resonated with me you wrote I'm quoting you here I believe that God does not give you answers when you pray if you come up with your answer he will let you know if your answer is correct either you feel comfortable with your decision or you're still confused and if you're confused then obviously your decision isn't right. That is what I believe. Tina, that's just so powerful and so well said. Are you basically saying that God speaks to you through your intuition? I think so. I do. I think the, the you know, some people call it the Holy Spirit or the, the Holy Ghost or, and, you know, it's coupled with, again, the structure that you have, you know, the, the structure that I had, not that we don't make mistakes. And, and we, of course, we all make a lot of them. That's why we're here, I think. But if we listen, I think we all have that God given gift that if we, if we ask, if we listen, we'll know, we'll know if we're on the right track or not. I've always lived that way, and I just so appreciated the way that you expressed it. Now, a few years ago, you took a class from the Landmark Forum about forgiveness. You wrote that what started out as an exercise in forgiveness turned into a lesson in gratitude. What did you mean by that? Isn't that just crazy? I I don't know how it happened, but I... I, all of a sudden, I, in trying to write to forgive my ex-husband, I thought, wait a minute, I'm I'm not God. He's not some lowly, you know, I'm not a bird sitting on the top, the top, you know, a branch of the tree and he's on the ground. That that equity is is wrong. You know, we both contributed. We both contributed to the the you know the marriage falling apart. And I realized that 
what I had learned was actually a gift. And I said, I felt like he had carved me out so deeply that I could then hold so much more love. And I started realizing that that was really a lesson. That was good for me. I always felt like I was a good person, you know, and I, I, I always had, you know, an empathetic, you know, I always had empathy for people. And, but this was, I had just had so much more understanding of life and struggles, what people are going through. And so I had to actually, instead of saying, I forgive you, say, thank you. I, I'm grateful. Well, I want the- to tell you something. I was a family court judge and a criminal court judge for 26 years. And I must tell you that if your book had been around when I was a judge, I would have handed it out to every single couple I had in family court because that exercise in understanding forgiveness and actually creating gratitude finding a way to be grateful for out of a situation that caused immense pain and anger is really, it's remarkable. It's astonishing. It is unique. And I just hope you know how special you are and your book is. Thank you. I, you know, I, I struggled. Of course it took me 25 years to be able to come to that point. And and the, and the the uh, taking that course helped because they said you need to be responsible for every single thing that happens to you, good and bad. It, you are responsible. That's a hard concept. So working, trying to, it took me days and days to finally for that to evolve into the understanding of gratitude. I think gratitude is probably, probably love and gratitude are probably the most important things we can learn in this life. Well, you know, what makes your book so unique and why I recommend it so highly is because there's a million celebrity memoirs out there and pretty much every single celebrity, except for very few, have been divorced. They've had marriages that failed, sometimes multiple marriages that failed, and they write about them. And I always wonder, What's the message they're trying to give us? Is there some theme that they want us to pick up on in terms of what they endured, the betrayal, the heartache, the pain? But in your case, you're the first person I've ever seen who's written a book who gives the story of the pain and the betrayal and the heartache, but the message is gratitude. And it's incredibly therapeutic. And I'm wondering to me again (laughs) i'm wondering if writing the book was therapeutic for you oh definitely i i started out with talking about and that was the hardest chapter or you know a couple chapters for me to write with 50 pages of every little thing that happened that you know wanted to i wanted to Right. No, and I don't mean right, but R I G H T. And it, it, I didn't touch it for, I got really stuck. I didn't touch it for maybe a year. I just couldn't get past it. And then having that experience and feeling that gratitude. And then uh, there we had a, I tried to call my ex husband and it's like, Give me, and I said, just when you're back in town, give me a, a, an hour of your time. I need to talk to you. It didn't happen right away. But just as I was finally getting to write that chapter, we talked and we, there was a real coming together and, a, a, you know, apologies, love, hugs. You know, it, it, and so 50 pages of crap, I, I was able to get rid of and just pull out the, the, what, you know, the, the, you have to have the facts. You can't not have what happened. 
but then to be able to come full circle is I was able then I was able to write it and I I, I joke I took I lined out you know all the things I I wanted to leave out I still have them in a folder <laughs> and I said well if if he's not happy about what's in the book I can give them the other 40 pages and say well this is what isn't in the book <laughs> so be glad <laughs> Well, I'm just really so impressed with your emotional maturity. Yes, you're empathetic. Yes, you're very kind to people. I saw how you treat your fans. I was one of them. But boy, oh boy, do you have a level of emotional maturity that is just astonishing and actually very rare. Now, Tina, I don't want to make you cry again, but I would like you to sit back for a moment and just listen to some of the amazing experiences you've had in your life. Just listen to this. When you were a kid, you got to see some of the greatest singers just hanging out in your dad's music room. People like Mel Torme, Joe Stafford, Doris Day, Rosemary Clooney, and Bing Crosby. You and your cousins sang back up on Frank Sinatra's recording of High Hopes and on the Everly Brothers recordings, along with three young men who later became the Letterman. When you did your first screen test at Warner Brothers at the age of 14, you met Gary Cooper. You were the first cheerleader for the Oakland Raiders. In your very first gig as a solo artist, you opened for Rowan and Martin in Australia. You and the King family co-starred with the Rolling Stones on the Hollywood Palace hosted by Dean Martin. You saw Sammy Davis Jr. on Broadway in Golden Boy and you got to meet him backstage. As a member of the Four King Cousins, you got to sing Follow the Yellow Brick Road with Ray Bolger, and you also got to work with John Wayne, Ray Charles, and Ella Fitzgerald. And that is just scratching the surface. So my question to you, Tina, is are there times when you have to pinch yourself to believe the life you've had? Yes. Yes. I think at the time, we were just as I said before, working, we were just doing what we do. Looking back, I I just, I'm amazed when I think about like Ray Bolger. Oh my goodness. We were, wait, I held the hat, you know, his hat that he wore. One of the biggest thrills of all was working with Ray Charles. I mean, we didn't, you know, we didn't work with, I mean, we were in the same show with him, but, and I wrote about it in the book that he, he heard us rehearsing and he thought that the King sisters were there, which was one of the biggest compliments I can ever imagine getting. And most of the people that we worked with were so, they were just regular folks. They were kind and they were, they just happened to be very talented, you know, they, but they were good people. I want to tell our viewers that you can learn more about the King family by going to their website, officialkingfamily.com. There is also a Facebook page for the King family and a Facebook page for the four King cousins. And of course, you can follow Tina Cole on her Facebook page. Well, Tina, I have only one more question for you. It's very important. Are you ready? Okay, I'm ready. Everyone wants to know if you can still tie a maraschino cherry stem in a knot with only your tongue. The most embarrassing, one of the most embarrassing moments of my life. Uh, you know what? When we get off, I'm going to go get a jar of cherries and try it. I don't know. <laughs> well, Miss Tina Cole, I want to tell you something. When you met Tom Jones at the Candy Store nightclub way back in 1969, you were so impressed with how kind he was to you that you vowed to be the same way with everyone you meet. And I'm here to tell you that you have most definitely stayed true to that vow. You've been so wonderful to me. I have immensely enjoyed meeting you and getting this chance to chat with you about your life and your career. I they say, I can die now peacefully. <laughs> Please could, don't. Oh, thank you, Harvey. I, I, yeah, he, he really did something that changed my life, and I believe that we are so anonymous these days. We used to be, you know, raised by a village, 
And uh, now you don't know anybody. You, you drive through and get your food, you, you know. But that one that couple of seconds of looking at someone in the eye and saying, thank you. You know, how was your day? How are you doing? Are you, you know, you look really busy today. I mean, whatever. But those few seconds can change a whole life, can change an attitude. can, And it spreads. It's like ripples. You know, all of a sudden they go, the next person they see, it's like, hi. It's, it, it's and, and I learned that from Tom. Isn't that crazy? Well, I learned it from you because those few seconds you spent with me, you and your mom, when you said, well, why do you have to choose between being a judge or being a talk show host? Why don't you do both? Be a judge until you don't want to anymore and then start a talk show. And you were just there to sign autographs. You didn't have to talk to me at all. So you really did hold true to that vow. You really did, in those few words, uh, open my eyes to a different perspective. And I'm so proud that publicly I get a chance to thank you. I think you're just the best. Thank you so much. It's been an honor to be with you. And, and thank you so much for your beautiful words, your kind words. Well, I want to thank you for all the joy you've brought us over the years, and especially for taking the time to appear on our show. Thank you, Harvey. Our guest has been the one and only Tina Cole, whose new memoir entitled My Three Lives is available on Amazon and wherever books are sold. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you to our producer, Steve Silver, my director of programming, Deborah Batsafin, my PR director, Lori Towers, my entire team at the XPTV1 network in the UK, and a very special thank you to Lori Jacobson, who Tina and I both adore. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks for watching. Be sure to check out all the great interviews on the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified when new videos are posted.